state conflict, I should say, between nation states to interstate conflict. So obviously we might call this civil wars, but people have categorised it in a range of different ways. Now, what has also happened is the reasons why people into enter into conflict has changed. Um, and, and increasingly so, we see what's called identity-based conflict. And often these identities are, are based around religion or ethnicity. Now, we would want to argue that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean that religion is a motivating factor in the conflict. It can be a, an attributing factor, but invariably conflicts are very complex and we can't identify one particular reason. They're often over a range of different issues, uh, resources, power, um, needs, etc. But increasingly so, religious identity is being dragged into those conflicts. And the problem with that is when religion becomes involved or implicated in conflict, uh, evidence shows that they're much more difficult to resolve and they're much more likely to be um, uh, increasingly bloody, have higher casualty rates, etc. And again, we, we can see that from uh, around the world. So, the reason why we need a, a multi religious approach is to respond really to these increasingly conf uh, complex conflicts. You know, if conflicts are complex, we need the, the equally um, nuanced and complex responses to try resolving those conflicts. We know that religions working together multiplies the impact of peace building endeavours. Uh, and there's, much, uh, there's great strength in working together, uh, increased resources, networks, knowledge, wisdom, etc. We've also found that working together, bringing religions to, together to work on, on different projects, whether that be peace building <coughs> development, also uh, facilitates interfaith engagement in a much more organic way. So perhaps the traditional model was people coming together in interfaith groups, talking, learning about each other's faith, and then moving on to action to do something together. And actually, it, it was often quite a hard step to take, with religions moving on to that, that, that action process. But if you bring together faith together around a particular project or with a particular driver reason, and that, that might be related to religion, it might not be, it might be a social project, it might be peace of some form of peace building development, then that facilitates a more organic, natural process of interfaith engagement where people start to learn about each other, learn about each other's faith. So, I want to go on to give two, two brief examples of our work then, working with multi-religious uh, organisations and communities. So, the first one's a project we've been working on with the European Council of Religious Leaders over the last year or so, uh, and that's been looking at multi-religious approaches to integration. So significant uh, influx of migrants, obviously into Europe, but throughout the world, can put significant strains on community cohesion. Um, it, the evidence is there, it leads to conflict, it can lead to stress for obviously the migrants, but also the host, host communities. Uh, and very evidently, it is one of the most pressing issues of our time. So we identified a range of projects around Europe, five different projects actually, one in the UK, Italy, Sweden, Germany and Poland where religious, different religious communities have come together to work to help address the problems both migrants face, but also the host communities face. And we looked very particularly, uh, it was a comparative study looking at projects where one religious organisational group were, was handling the integration processes, compared to a, a group of religions coming together uh, uh, and uh, becoming involved in integration. And actually what we found was there was a significant range of benefits to, to that multi-religious approach. So things like uh, traditionally religion has been seen certainly in Europe as actually a barrier to integration, believe it or not. If people come to religious communities or religious ethnic communities within a country, they tend to get embedded within that religious ethnic community and don't make the kind of networks and social connections which will help them integrate into the community. A multi-religious approach helped overcome that. You know, we saw significant evidence where uh, the coming together of, of different religions, the help from different religious communities, help bridge those, uh, those um, uh, barriers to increase social networks, employability, etc. Also help improve the quality of integration services, so things like language, cultural awareness, trauma, trauma healing, spiritual support. Again, that, that multi-religious network it helped improve that. Um, there's a whole list of potential benefits, so I'm just going to name a few. Breakdown of negative stereotypes and uh, counteracting uh, negative narratives about 
uh, about migrants, but also about host communities and actually meeting each other, uh, humanising each other, breaking down those negative stereotypes wouldn't necessarily have been done if migrants come into their own religious community and, and stay within that. Um, Obviously, increasingly important, particularly for policymakers, there's also some initial evidence, anyway, that, that the multi-faith approach helps also assist in combating radicalisation. So again, it's that idea that, that the migrants might come into a community, might not integrate properly with host communities, um, you know, therefore might be susceptible, because migrants are obviously particularly vulnerable often uh, to uh, radicalisation, um, stereotyping, negative narratives, etc. So, so again, that multi-religious approach helped break that down. Um, so, so, so that was our work, actually, that went forward to the G20 last year in Frankfurt, our policy as a result of that. And, and increasingly so, policymakers are recognising and acknowledging. I was at a meeting last week in Brighton, actually, where you had uh, UN representatives, our own department for international development, the German government, the Swiss government, and they'd all come to the UK specifically to meet faith-based organisations. A lot of big faith-based organisations were there because they're increasingly saying we know it's imperative to, to engage with religious organisations. So the second example uh, I want to give you is a project we've been supporting in Myanmar. This is a peace, peace building project that's been taking place in three different locations in Myanmar. In uh, Matila, in, in the central region, where there's been a, a significant rise in Buddhist nationalism, which has led to some of the problems obviously we've seen with the Rohingya. Um, a, a project up in the north, in, in Kachin, where there's been a, an ethnic insurgency going on for some time. And, and also over at Rakhine, uh, dealing with the problems between Buddhist Muslim tensions there. And the project was specifically aimed at bringing together women of faith, and very particularly women of faith, from different religions to build women of faith networks and communities to help uh, address many of the problems uh, and violence that are going on in their communities. So what does a multi-religious approach bring here? Why not just bilateral engaging with Buddhist women or, or, or Muslim women? So again, the evidence that the multi-faith approach actually gave legitimacy to women within the uh, Burmese communities and societies that they wouldn't normally have. Often, particularly Muslim women, probably wouldn't be allowed to go to meetings, etc. But actually, the legitimacy of it being a religious organisation, a multi-faith meeting, actually uh, meant that women were able to go along and participate, and they'd be given a huge opportunity to participate in the peace building process because of their, their religious identity. Also gave peace builders who were working with these women access to uh, families and communities. Uh, hugely influential arenas that m perhaps formal peace building projects just wouldn't reach. It also um, provided avenues and mechanisms for action on gender and social equality, working directly with women's communities and groups. Uh, interestingly, it acted as an early warning system, and again, this was proven particularly effective that the women were excellent indicators of when tensions were increasing in communities and because they talked between each other across those religious community divides and lines where often people didn't meet. Um, although these, uh, the Muslims and Buddhists, particularly in Rakhine, have lived together side by side you know, for, for decades, they rarely interacted and rarely talked. So this multi-religious group actually allowed for this communication and actually allowed them to communicate when tensions were increasing in the, in the communities. It also allowed um, the building of bridges within communities that men might not be able to facilitate because of their social status. It was much easier for women to interact because of their status within communities. So um, there's just two very brief examples of, of the type of work we do. So I want to end just by saying, um, I, I guess it's a caveat really, any type of religious peace building, including multi-religious peace building, is not straightforward. Uh, and as we can see by looking around the world, religion's inherently ambivalent. There's no, um, I know VJ mentioned at the beginning about all religions are inherently about peace. Religion's also very easily manipulated for violence, and, uh, and that kind of almost goes without saying these days. So, so in fact, we've got to work very hard to create the conditions where religious communities, religious people actually turn towards part, the path of peace because there's always that potential 
for um, religious adherents or, or communities to become violent. So it's not a straightforward process and it's not something we can take uh, for, for granted. But actually, the, certainly from our work, we can see very significant advantages to multi-religious approaches in some conflict and post-conflict situations. There are certainly difficult tensions to negotiate, not least between our own religious identities in, 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 and beliefs in relation to others. And how we remain authentic to our own religious beliefs and traditions was also appreciate in accepting uh, 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 on their own terms other religious communities. But really negotiating these, these kind of difficult tensions is, is what peace building is all about. Um, and it's why really events like this are so important and all those interfaith and multi-religious events bringing people together uh, and crossing those boundaries. Uh, we face many difficult uh, and sometimes daunting, cha daunting challenges in the world today, which both drive violent conflict, but also we work very much and we want to remember those kind of structural conflicts, so oppression, inequality, gender inequality, social inequality. And we can see this with, the, with instances of rise of violent extremism, ethnic and religious conflict, conflict caused by climate change, uh, increasingly so in the future there's going to be conflict over uh, increasingly scarce resources, rise of right-wing nationalism, associated with xenophobia, social economic inequality, I mean the challenges are huge. However, I'm convinced from our research, and certainly multi-religious uh, cooperation is absolutely paramount for tackling and overcoming many of these most difficult challenges we face in the world today. Thank you very much.